All right, we're live. Chris, welcome to the show. I oh, appreciate being here, man. Um, I think uh, we've had a lot of great guests on the show lately, but our, our listeners are particularly excited about you coming on. But if you could, for those people that don't know you, can you just give a few minutes of, uh, about your background, what you do and, and where you come from, and then we go from there? Sure. I, I'm, I'm not that good at talking about myself, but uh, uh, I'm an endurance coach. Uh, within the fitness space. Uh, my background is in the sport of triathlon, swimming, biking, and running. Uh, I happen to be a specialist in the longer distance triathlons. I've done uh, 10 full distance Ironmans, I think uh, eight maybe in Kona. Uh, I've placed second in Kona. I've placed second in uh, the Ultra World Championships. Um yeah, if you race a lot, you 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 end up doing fairly well. I raced a lot while going to college. Uh, my degree is in finance. I'm a, a really a math, a, a numbers kind of um, coach. Um, I got involved into the CrossFit space in about 2008. Uh, for your listeners that are not aware, CrossFit is really a functional fitness um sport it really caters to the fitness enthusiast meaning the non-specialist and i happened to get back into coaching uh around 2012 uh coaching elite crossfit athletes and um since 2013 uh the the cross the crossfit games which is the essentially the world championship competition uh, for the CrossFit athlete, uh, I started coaching those elite uh, competitors. And since then, I've, I've, I've accumulated uh, some decent success in the space with um, world champions, male, female uh, teams, teenagers, masters of all age groups. Uh, I think maybe three dozen that have sat on the top spot, uh, along with multiple other podium spaces within there. Uh, since then, I've 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 gradually stepped out into that more recreational based athlete, the non specialist, which happens to be everybody that serves in the military, every first responder, whether it's law enforcement, firefighting, uh, and then looking and 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 targeting the people within High Rocks and Tough Mudder um, and Spartan. Um, Lately, the biggest area of, of interest with, with most people within the space that I coach is high rocks, without question. It is, it's what's moving the needle at the greatest rate. Okay, interesting. It's, I, I guess it's the endurance side of high rocks, maybe like more so than, than CrossFit, that's uh, particularly well suited to your background, right? Yeah, it is. I, I, I find, though, that... that it, it's interesting to me. I I I just had a, a, a long conversation with a power lifter yesterday. And what's interesting about the CrossFit space is it's it's catering to a, a, an athlete that doesn't want to do one thing. They're interested in in hybrid type of training. They're interested in doing a multitude of things to create their fitness and to keep them motivated. Um, and so it's very challenging for me when I step back into even triathlon based training and and try and and have conversations with specialist coaches about hybrid racing or functional fitness type training, because their position is is so incredibly biased in their space that. They'll always say and accuse, whether it's powerlifting, whether it's it's a running specialist coach, they'll always say that's not enough. And it takes a long time to understand that balance. I mean, I'll give you a good example. When I swam in college, we were swimming for 40,000 meters a week. Uh, when I got into triathlons, I was swimming 25,000 meters a week. And if I was programming for you and you wanted to win the CrossFit games, I'd program 2000 meters a week. That's a massive difference from a specialist to a triathlete to a CrossFit games champion. 
And that is hard for someone to understand with that minimal amount of time, how can you create greatness? Do you find that with the work that you're doing with Hyrux, because it is a set, uh, you know, set distance and so on every time, do you find how your programming for that is vastly different to what you're doing for something like CrossFit? Yeah, I mean, when you get, when you know what the answer to the test is, then it makes it much, much easier. Um, Programming for CrossFit is very challenging because you don't know what the event is. Um, sometimes you 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 don't know until seconds before, and so how do you train for something that you have no concept of of what you're actually going to be tested on? And the way that you do it is that you have to train a broad range. We call it time domain. So if you think about how fast you can run one minute, well, then compare that to your two minute speed, your five minute speed, your ten minute speed you're 20 and 30 and 40, it goes all the way up to walking speed. And you've got to train that entire spectrum of speeds so that that athlete is prepared for whatever comes up. And that's something that's been very new within the CrossFit space of of realizing running isn't just running. If you want to be good at a particular speed, you must practice that speed. And, And within the high rock space, this is the challenge for most people. They're, they need to understand that, yes, you have to run 8,000 meters, but your total time domain is what you really must be thinking about. So if you're running 8,000 meters, but your total amount of duration is 90 minutes, then you're going to have 90 minutes of time on your legs. So what speed do you train? Well, in my opinion, it would be speeds that range from if you did a, a five mile or an 8K for time as your fastest. And then what is your speed that you can maintain based upon your, your targeted finishing time? So if it's 90 minutes, I would ask you, what would be the fastest pace per thousand meters you could hold for 90 minutes? And there's your kind of sweet spot of, of, of range. Now, you still have to cl- train the neighboring speeds because if those initial speeds you know, go out the window, and they will, you've got to have some support coming from somewhere. But high rocks, it's at least what they give you in terms of that range on how to train better than what you would get in CrossFit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. So, so do you feel like, <clears throat> if you think about a typical running plan, for example, might have slow, steady zone two stuff, and then it might have some yeah. threshold stuff, and then it might have some intervals at speed. Uh, do, do you feel like for someone training for high rocks, you would still include all of those or would it be more concentrated around that sort of race pace sort of stuff? That's a great question. It really depends on the amount of time that you have available to train. So if you're a, a, a professional and you have unlimited free time, then you're, you're going to spend a much greater percentage of your training doing zone two, you know, almost that 80, 20 rule. But let's just say that you have four days of of running available to you because you have a day job and then you're going to commit another two days of strength-based training. So you're doing six days a week and you're limited though because you've got a full-time job and a family. Well, then your ratios must be slightly different. The key piece that people must recognize is that High Rocks, it's a full body experience. And if you are are leaving motor units behind, muscle fibers untrained, then you're leaving some of your capacity unavailable to you. So so what you must think about when you're training the entire body with limited time, you have to train a variety of speeds, a variety of intensities. You know, simply put, you've got to train easy pace, which would be zone two. You got to train moderate pace, which would be essentially around your, your 8K pace, you know, you're, you're somewhere in that 30 to 40 minute time domain pace. And then you're, you've got to train uh, fast pace or high intensity, which would really be a, a intensity that would elicit VO2 max. And if you, you cover that core along with the other extremes, such as jogging and maximal effort sprinting, 
you've got that entire spectrum covered. Um, and, and that's where I would, would start in answering that question. It really depends on how much time you have and what are your goals. No, it's a good point, actually. I talk, talk to a lot of like elites or, or, you know, that sort of level on, on this podcast, but not everyone can train 20 hours a week and uh, understanding right. like that's a major limitation for a lot of people is, is certainly a good point. Uh, <laughs> I think back on my, I think on my triathlon days and, and I did it as a professional and I, I remember that, I mean, this is how brain damaged I was back then. I, I, my last time in Kona, I said to myself the next day, wow, I, I'm really not even sore. I, I can do this, I think, seven days in a row and finish sub 12 hours. I mean, that's how brain damage, you know, and you stair step your way to that. I, taking a step back now, I look at it as an impossible task. I, I it, let alone having unlimited free time. I can't imagine somebody who works full time, has a family, that can possibly take on an Ironman. It, it seems, I, and that's why I don't coach people in Ironman because I don't know how you would do it with limited time. It's too big, but High Rocks comes in in a sweet spot, right? It's in an area that you don't have to do a lot of running. You don't have to do a lot of lifting and you can still have a solid performance without sacrificing your job or your family. I think that's one one reason we're seeing such huge growth in the sport, right? It's because yep. it's so accessible to so many people. Yep, very manageable, very manageable. But like back to your question, I think that's the key when you look at the programming is, you know, I mentioned it's about the free time of the individual, their available time, also their goal. And I that's really what we call taking into account the athlete and and the event and this is the the essence of what i do is is we build the the program around the strengths the weaknesses the available time the goal of that athlete and we then target the event and that's what's called an athlete centered model um, most of the training that is out there and available online today it doesn't take into consideration the athlete it just looks at the event. So like, for example, if you wanted to do um, a marathon, you can just go to Runner's World and get a free downloadable PDF that will essentially just stack on more volume. And as you add more volume, your body adapts to that volume and you keep doing it until your last workout's a marathon. The problem with that is it doesn't take into account who you are, you know, your gender, your injuries, nothing. And that's, that's a difficult challenge. Um, but what makes High Rock so beautiful is you're not specializing in the movement of running. You've got to do a lot of different things in your training. And that's what makes it more, in my opinion, approachable. Yeah, yeah. With the, uh, because High Rock is a blend of running and other stuff like there's yeah. an element of strength and muscular endurance and so on. How do you um, do? You, how do you think about that differently to a, a typical running based program? Do you have to? Like, is it a case of managing the volume, looking at the client, and seeing where their priorities lie, and so on? How do you feel about balancing wow, that's, that? Yeah, that's a really a well. That's a this is a good discussion to have because you know one of the things that High Rocks has done that is is truly truly remarkable is they put results on their website that um is based upon your gender it's based upon your age group it's based upon the division in which you want to compete in and it's readily available to anybody and everybody so if you want to do comparisons on your um your running time, your total accumulated running time, you could do it. You could do a comparison of against your fifth running segment. That to me is amazing. Um, as a numbers guy, what I did is I scraped uh, all of the data that is publicly available within highrocks.com. 
And what I did was, is I, I looked at what do people actually end up doing based upon age and where is the opportunity um, in terms of coaching to help provide more accurate programming recommendations. Let's say, and, and let's just talk about the movement of running. So we've, we've, we've earlier talked about like this min max and we look at speeds, but, but, you know, from 8,000 meters to your total amount of time, but we can get much, much more granular based upon what high rocks has made available and publishes. Um, And that's what I have done. I've, I've really done a deep dive into what others have done based upon age group. If you eliminate the the outliers, you sit with a a core. And this is where the 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 fun part comes because now you're looking at someone's a, a gender and an age group and how they're progressing on their first 1k versus their eighth 1k. And that gives you a good assessment of these age groups and their ability to actually pace properly or or what the the let's call it an obstacle the damage it creates that's how i got started was i was looking at how do we maximize opportunity like where does it sit and what was interesting is that when i removed the professionals out of those results then the data became very interesting to me because the professionals have done a much better job they're much more accelerated. They have more free time. They can experiment and really optimize where there's value in terms of time, race after race after race. And that's where I am today is that I have got a data set. And what I use is the, let's call them amateurs versus the pros. And I, I use where is the opportunity for improvement, but also where is the opportunity to to really truly hone in on accurate training, where you're not just guessing, you're truly training on the speeds that you're more than likely going to do in your next event. So you're using that data on a on a on a total level. You're you're you're, you're making assessments based on that, and and then comparing it. And looking at the client in front of you and comparing the t- the two of those, are you to make a decision on, on on what the athlete should be doing? Yes. So, like for example, what I would do is I would plug in. Um, so let's just say that you've never done a high rocks. Mm-hmm. Well, and you're a coach, and you're giving someone some advice on on how to to prepare. Um, and what to expect. So it's not a surprise. I mean, this is one of the, the, the mistakes that a lot of individuals, they make when they, when they enter um, a, a event that they've never done before. So if it is your first high rocks event, they just, a lot of times they'll just, they'll prepare like they would think that they should prepare, but they're really going in with zero game plan. They're, they're essentially on this adventure. And unfortunately, with that, there is often they're, 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 they're treated with disappointment because they haven't thought through these challenges, meaning when they get to a challenge, they're surprised by it. And any time that you are surprised in a competition, whether you're doing it recreationally or as a profession, you underperform. When the brain is surprised by how difficult something is, meaning you underestimated the amount of of pain that you're in, in that particular moment, you have a mismatch between your perceived amount of what you thought it was going to be, what it actually is. Now that when that occurs, the brain's surprised because the situation is way worse than you ever thought it was going to be. So the brain sits and thinks about this and it's like, wait a minute, this wasn't supposed to be so difficult yet we're really suffering. And now the brain's in a position of like, I got to protect the body. I got to protect the host. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make what the situation much, much more difficult to get them to slow down so that we can self-preservation for whatever is coming next. And that's a mistake. 
like, like, for example, the people listening. What you want to think about is this. If you ran a lap around the track as fast as you possibly can go, one of the things you have to think about is where within that lap, what meter as you're running does it become physically and emotionally so difficult for you that your brain tells you if you don't slow down, we're not going to finish. Now, that is what we call a sticking point within a workout. And there's sticking points in terms of where you are within time, but there's also sticking points in workouts where it's in terms of difficulty. Like if you had to run up a steep grade or the pulling and pushing of the sled within high rocks, there's, there, there's sticking points where they're surprisingly difficult within the entire competition. At that sticking point, you experience the highest level of doubt, you experience the highest level of emotional distress, but it's also the physical discomfort. Now, when you encounter that moment, and for me, it occurs around 240, 250 meters into that 400, if I think that, oh man, this is a joke, it's just one lap around the track, it's not gonna hurt. But when you get there and your body is literally inside out, you feel like your legs and your chest and your brain is on fire and you're pulling air through your ears. This is a mismatch between your perceived amount of pain, you thought it was a joke versus actual. In 100% of the cases, you will underperform. So what you must do for a new athlete you have to look at high rocks and say, where am I going to be encountering extreme discomfort so you don't have a mismatch? That's part of your planning. So when a coach has an athlete within their gym and that athlete solicits help, that coach has to have some tools available to give that athlete a better assessment for their actual race day strategy. And so what I did is I, I, I created a, a tool and, and you know I'm making it available for the people that attend the High Rocks Aerobic Capacity course where they can plug in their estimated finishing time. Now, what I do is I take that estimated finishing time and based upon your gender and age group and the scraping of the data that I pulled off of the last five years of highrocks.com, and it will predict what your runtime will be. Well, based upon that runtime, it will also then predict what are your target 1K times as you progress through. Well, once you have those 1K times, you now have a range of training paces that you can target. So it not only prepares you for where your runtimes should be based upon your guess of your finishing time, but it now gives the coach an idea of your target training paces. You know, and we call that specific training. You, you train for what is known. And that would be, in my opinion, the highest value of someone's time. Okay. And right. that's where I would start. Uh, all right, great. It's, it, it's interesting you were talking about like the, the disconnect between like, how you think something's going to feel and then how it feels. I remember having a call with someone yeah. and talking about how he feels on the start line. And he's an, he's Matty Green. He's, he's an ex Marine. And he, he was like, I'm, I'm there and I'm ready to suffer. And I thought I, I, that, that, that sort of thought process has helped me ever since. Cause sometimes you're like, how's it going to feel? And you're like, maybe apprehensive and not knowing how it's going to feel. But if you just go into it, like I'm ready to suffer there's, yeah. there's not that shock. There's not that surprise. And then you know what's up ahead, right? Um, yep. I, I was I was going to talk to you about some, some of the, the, the mindset stuff in, in high rocks and endurance yep. sports as well. Um, but you talked, yep. when we um, when I, I met you in Chicago and we were at that shakeout run the day before the race, um, yep. you talked about betting on yourself and taking risks on yourself, uh, which I thought was interesting because in high rocks, like, you have got to toe the line to a certain extent and like pace it and not go out too hot. But at the same time, like going back to what you were saying, like you have got to take risk on yourself and bet on yourself. And I spoke to Eve Muirhead, uh, an ex Olympian um, recently on the podcast. And she, she sort of talked about the same thing about how the, the Olympics where she won gold 
was like where she wasn't afraid to lose anymore and she like she backed herself as in previous olympics she you know maybe trying not to lose um yeah can, can, can you talk about that area some more yeah so what what i think what we talked about in in chicago was this this where as we age, as as we 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 get older, what what happens with us is that we we end up taking on more and more responsibilities, and the 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 problem with taking on more responsibilities is that we 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 pick up a, a additional obligations, and with those obligations, what we get is is um, unsolicited commentary uh where we're and and what and i don't want people to be confused you, you may be crushing it in your job but what what i'm talking about are these these whispers the the critiques the criticisms the 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 let's call it constructive feedback these unsolicited um comments what they do is they end up weighing on everybody and what happens is, is although they're minor, they eventually, they begin to build and they begin to take root. And where they take root is in the very fabric of, of who we are. And, and it attacks the key thing that we own. And that is our own health and fitness. And, and what I mean by health and fitness is, it's not your, your physical side. I mean, that is a part of it. What it also is, though, it's your emotional and that mental resiliency. And that is the essence of, of, of what makes us um, who we are. So when, when I, myself as a coach, I realize that that, that is a limitation. Um, now, that same insecurity is what teenagers have. You may be disagreeing with it, but it's the truth. And I see it over and over again. And this is why middle-aged adults have a tendency to play it safe because they don't wanna take any more risks. They don't want any more criticism. But what I need to do is I need an athlete to realize that what is hiding within that risk is confidence. That's where confidence is hiding. And I know that it's going to take a, for you as an athlete, to do something that's seemingly impossible. But as a coach, I'm motivating you to put your courage on the line. Because in that moment, when you are truly tested in doing something that your body doesn't want to do, where you hit that sticking point and you don't slow down, where you actually take that risk and do something that you unnaturally don't feel confident in actually making it happen. That's where greatness is created within athletes, whether you're recreational or whether or not you want to be an Olympian or a world champion. That's what we must do. And so a lot of athletes, they don't realize like, where does this occur? So when we talk about endurance running, you know, in doing Ironman or doing a marathon or doing a 10K, we always have an upper limit, this barrier, and we call it a maximum sustainable pace or your lactate threshold. If you go above that lactate threshold, essentially you're accumulating fatigue faster than you can remove it, simply put. So what do we do? We just stay right below that line and we play it safe. If you always play it safe, you know what's going to happen is you're always going to be mediocre. And what we as coaches must do is we must encourage athletes to take risk. We must make them realize that that's where their greatness will sit. And, you know, I, I think that coaches don't realize the power that they have. Most athletes are afraid of failing. Well, what if you're a coach that tells that athlete, I realize that this is difficult. I realize that if you're doing a mile for time, that last lap around the track, I realize you're in a non-sustainable pace. I realize you're suffering, but I'm encouraging you to take that risk because this is how you're going to take on more risk. And with that, you create even a higher level of confidence. You know, I think back early on about like, 
myself as an athlete. I was a skinny little kid and I wasn't good at anything. You know, when I was 15, 16 years old, I just, I was late in developing and my brother was, Jesus, you know, he was a grown man by the time he was 13. And I, 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 I it was hard growing up in that space. And I, I, I had a dad who was also very challenging and, and expected things that I thought were just incredibly unreasonable. And, and, and uh, I, it, it, it really, as a kid, it, it impacted me in, in a negative way. But I remember watching the Hawaiian Ironman Kona on TV and I'm there watching it with my dad and, and the way that they film and, and present the Ironman, they present it in a way where it's so darn motivating. It's so, they make it in a way where it's like, it's, I know it's impossible, right? It's a 2.4 mile ocean swim. It's a 112 mile bike ride across the lava fields of Hawaii. And then that marathon is in the heat of the day. I mean, it's not starting at 4 a.m. It's in the worst, most brutal time. But it's so beautifully presented that as a 17-year-old, as I'm watching it, I, I thought to myself, I'm not good in sport, but man, if I did that event, if I was able to finish it, then that would be mine. And, and no one would take it from me. And I would get some respect. And it just, it came out of me and I said it out loud. And there's my dad who's sitting next to me. It's just the two of us. And imagine the power that he has in that moment, right? And that's what a coach has, this power. Imagine if he was condescending to me, like if he was disrespectful in some way, if he was sarcastic. I, I would have cowered, you know, and, 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 but he didn't, he, he, you know, in the, in, in, in the, in the one moment that, that I needed him. And this is how I feel as a coach. When I really needed him, he delivered, he looked over at me and he says, you know, let's make that happen. And he shouldn't have said it because I've never done anything remotely close to doing that. But what he said was, you're going to take a substantial risk and you are going to suffer and you may fail, but I respect that effort and I'm going to support you on it. And, and I, I, that was a moment in my life that changed my entire trajectory because he encouraged me to take that risk. And that's what I'm talking about. And it doesn't matter who you are. You have to take risk in your fitness. Otherwise, you're always going to wake up and you're always going to be mediocre. You're always going to underperform. And that's what I take into with everybody that I coach is I realize that you're walking in the door and, and you're afraid. I realize that you're nervous, but I want you to know that I'll never mock you. I'll never be condescending to you. I'll never be disrespectful because I know what that is like. And I know if I can get you to take that risk and have some courage, what sits for you on the other side. And, and that's what I think a coach's true role is is to improve the quality of their life because of the experiences in doing the unknown. Love it. And that's, that's I find it so interesting that it can happen in that just moments. And sometimes the coach might even not realize that you're, they're in that moment for that client. Um, yeah. Like if it, you were, yeah. if, if you were running a 400, I would ask you like, where, where is it that, you know, it really, you start having doubt. Well, that's where I would stand as a coach. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to go and I've got your back. I need you to go because that's the highest in every workout. There is certain moments that represent the core of that workout where, where, where performance, whether it's 
physical, mental, emotional performance has changed. And that's where the coach should be sitting. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, in, in the world of CrossFit, you've worked with top, top names, you know, the, the who's who of CrossFit um, mm -hmm. and, and throughout sport as well. I, I'm interested, are there any common traits that you see in those those people, aside from they're just like physically amazing? Um, in any, champions? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's any, a good like, question. Any common traits that, that that you've noticed that think maybe people could apply to their lives in some way? Yeah, you know what's funny? I, I mean, we always talk about this word coachable, and I think that that's getting overrated. I I, I think that people are losing sight of what is is coachable. Um, the the one piece that they all have in common, and I'll give you an example, um, and then we can talk about it. So Matt Frazier, who is the most dominant male CrossFit Games champion in history, um, I had the chance to work with him since 2014 until he retired. And one of the pieces that was really compelling about Matt was he took responsibility in the decisions that were made. He always wanted to know what is the game plan? What are we doing? Where's the progression? And he wanted to really truly understand that that was the highest value of his time. So for example, if, if, if you're, you're training and you wanna get better on an assault bike, you know, where you're pedaling with your legs, but your arms are also moving back and forth or, you know, a, a, a rogue echo bike uh, or an airdyne bike, um, he wanted to get good at that. Well, the question is, is that, you know, how do you answer a guy that says, I wanna win on uh, an assault bike. Well, what we have to do is create some common ground and why that is a fatigue generating piece of equipment. And once we have common ground, we then explain the training protocol. And what I tell him is, is that, you know, can you, Matt, do more work on this bike if your legs were not contributing more fatigue and you were just moving your arms back and forth? could you end up doing more work? And based upon my earlier explanation on how fatigue is generated on that assault bike and why it's so difficult, the answer is yes. Well, if that's true, then you should maximize work capacity by training arms only. Same thing, could your legs do more work without contributing arm fatigue? And the answer is yes. So then what you should do is train the legs separately. And then the theory of specificity says that if you want to get good in a movement, you have to do the movement. So then you train the, the actual bike itself. But there's the three training protocols. He now understands it. Well, I can take it one step further and say, you know, Matt, Matt since you're, you're, you're on this bike and you're training legs only, can we maximize adaptation in another movement? And the movement that's close to riding a bike, the movement pattern of the legs, what's close is running. But how can we make sure that that transference is maximized? Well, the way you do it is cadence. So when Matt runs at five minutes for maximum effort, he averages 180 steps. That represents 90 RPMs. So if he's doing an equivalent intensity, meaning a five minute maximum effort on the bike, then he should be pedaling at 90 RPMs, which is equivalent to 180 steps. Now he has a cadence when he's riding the bike along with a heart rate based intensity. And he gets it, he sees that. So back to when I first met Matt in 2014, he came up to me and he says, I would really, I, 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 I would like your help. And one thing as a coach that I've never shied away from is, is testing my methods on, on creating cardiorespiratory endurance and muscular stamina. I've never shied away with it. And Matt Frazier came from um, a weightlifting background. He trained at the Olympic Training Center. He was one of the bright kids and US hopefuls in weightlifting until he broke his back. And after he broke his back, that career was over for him. So I knew that when he asked me to help him in January of 2014, I'm sorry, 2015. And uh, I said to him, I said, let me ask you something. Are you concerned about this, what we call interference effect? And the interference effect is, is, is really 
it's something that's broadcasted really a lot by the weightlifting community, which says if you do too much cardio, it's going to interfere with your strength. But this interference effect, it's just essentially that. If you do too much of one thing, it's going to interfere with another thing. And that was in all the literature back then. And it was one of the things that I disproved about this, this fitness enthusiast, this, this more recreational athlete, this hybrid athlete. And I said, are you worried about if you're doing running, if you're doing more rowing and, and working cardio, is it going to interfere with your strength? And so to answer your question, what's, what is unique among champions is this. He looked at me and he said to me, he said, I know that if I never fix this, if I don't work on my running, then I will never win. And yes, I, I, I've been on the podium. But I don't care if this drops me out of the top 10 or the top 20 or even removes me from the sport because I want to win. I need to do something exceptional. If I don't do this, if I do what everybody else is doing, but not this, then I'll never win. And I want to win. So he took ownership of it. He realized the risk. But he also gave full endorsement to the game plan. And thank God, you know what? He went on to create a dynasty for himself and he proved that that interference effect is really not applicable based upon the limited volumes that you're doing within the CrossFit space. Every champion has had that mentality. I want to win. I told the CrossFit Games champion this year, Jeffrey Adler, there was a 5K run and he's, clearly proven now he's the fastest runner in the sport and he was down on points going into two more days. And I told him, I said the night before I go, you know what? I need you to lose. And he asked me, he says, well, why is that? And I said, because you have a maximum lift coming up later, which is neurological and it's very technical lift. I don't need your neurological system, your CNS to be nuked going into that because it's accumulation of points. And so if it comes down to a finishing sprint and you've got 300 meters out, don't go. That is a true champion. You know what he didn't do? He didn't go. In that 5K run, his heart rate never got above 171. Wow. And his lactate threshold was 176. He took it easy. That is a person who wants to win. And, you know, there's many athletes that I work with that say, I don't want to win. I want a podium. And that's a whole different game plan. But if you want to win, there is an element of risk that you must take. And that risk may mean that you're not going to make the podium. And not many have that. They're, will they're willing to gamble their, their second, third place on, on, on the chance of becoming first. Yeah. yeah, and that's a very hard thing to do. I mean, I know probably people listening are like, like, I don't see why that's tough. Well, imagine you, you've got, you know, a, a, a huge amount of sponsors and you've got performance bonuses that pay you for third place, second place, and first place. You've got TV. It's, it's, there is a lot riding on it. And, and, and we see this now surfacing within mental health that these younger athletes who have sacrificed their youth to create this, this greatness are now being pulled by coaches and coaches online training platform. Like you got to represent my training platform. And then you've got these sponsorships and then they've got the family and friends, which they've alienated. And now they're isolated with this tremendous pressure on themselves. And then they crack. It's, it's very understandable why because they're not equipped to deal with these massive decisions based upon the sacrifice that they made. Um, yeah, it's not an easy piece. Unless you've been there, you just don't know. Um, if, we, if, we, if we shift, like we, we've talked about Hyrox a little bit, but um, if we talk about that some more, and I know, I know you were at Chicago, I know you were at the Elite Race, uh, and this is a bit of a, an open question, but what was your, I think that was the first, 
event, Hyrux event that you'd been at. What was your yeah. what was your perception of the event? Did you like it? How was the the, the elite race? Yeah, tell us tell us your immediate thoughts on that. I was okay. My first impression in walking in the venue. So what is so incredibly impressive about High Rocks is the venue. I, I don't think they spare any expense for the athlete experience. I, I, I It's truly on a, on a level that it shocked me. It's almost like the first time when you go into a, a stadium to see a football match or a, a baseball game at nighttime. The magnitude of what you see, it's shocking. It's like you're not ready for that. I, I was blown away at the 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 way that something that is seemingly complex and complicated, if you look at all the things that you have to do and the flow of these movements, and how are you going to get a, a thousand meter run in there that's accurate? And that layout in Chicago, it was it was incredible because their thousand meter run was only a lap and a half. And to make that work, right? The, to navigate these, these groups. Yeah. That, that, that was really impressive to me. My, I was awestruck when I walked in about the budget that it took to do that. Um, the second piece though, was, was how are you going to prevent athletes from, overlapping and interfering where you get to the 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 skier or the rower and there's no but there's no equipment and that's all thought out there is no logistic problems people come in they warm up they go to the starting line and three two one go and they just seamlessly flow from 8 a.m to 8 p.m it was awesome it was it was so structured yeah it's I, I really admire the fact that they've ironed out these bugs that for the athlete's experience it's flawless it's flawless i, I was at london at the weekend with 12,000 athletes and i think it was actually I, the best event i've been to as well like in terms of how it ran it was yeah flawless. i just got off the phone i just got off the phone with gus um who announced oh, right. there and um, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. And we were talking about it. Two days, he said, yeah. 12 hour shifts. I mean, yeah. nuts. That's, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I think that that uh, the organizers in the UK, have, they did an amazing job in in capturing tremendous momentum in High Rocks with, within the community. Um, yeah, but what's amazing is is that somehow, some way, you process twelve thousand. What we have in Chicago, three. I, I can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. very, um, it's very impressive. And and what's also interesting, like if you go to a CrossFit competition, there's judges, officials, you know, HQ staff, it, all over the place. Here, there's very minimal people because it's so structured it's so obvious of the flow and the where athletes must go it's not like people are getting lost there's zero confusion to me that was very impressive yeah 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 i yeah. um, yeah, loved it on the on the elite side of the sport obviously there yep. was the elite race in chicago um i'm interested to know your thoughts like the 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 there's like four major races this year that then guys are trying to qualify for the for the world championships um and there's people trying to qualify for those majors how do you think about peaking uh and and how often an athlete can peak during it during the year how often they should race like obviously like from a crossfit background like i guess the guy a lot of the guys are just looking to peak once a year at the crossfit games um yeah, how, how do you think about that for some of these for some of these elite athletes that might be listening, but then also for for age group athletes that might be competing throughout the year and then wanting to go to the world championships and so on? Can you talk about that some more? Sure. I, it's it's interesting to me because uh, when I did the sport of triathlons, we never peaked um, because we were always in this state of training and we would race two times a month, maybe three times a month. 
Um, and, and so what we would do is we would sharpen. We would, we would, we would look at our races um, and be aware of them. And we would structure our training so that we were coming into events where we were slightly rested, but I wouldn't call it a taper. What I would do is I would call it a sharpen. And what a sharpen is, is, is where you are scaling back somewhat on the volume of a particular workout, but you're replacing that volume with intensity. So the net net of fatigue is, is essentially the same, but because um, what, when we, when we, we, go into an event, we're actually the next day taking a little more volume out um, and replacing it with intensity. But when it gets replaced with intensity in an interval style workout, what I'll do is give an athlete more rest. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the workout is a lot more challenging for that athlete. But what we're doing is we're really dialing that, that neuromuscular system and sharpening it so that it's it's lively. It's got jump. It's got bounce. So what I, to, to visualize what I'm talking about, if I make you run long and slow, I make you do zone two. And let's say I make you, you're doing an hour long, easy run. And whenever it gets difficult, you could walk. What that's going to do is it's going to make you feel heavy. It's going to make you feel sluggish. You will have a, a, a sensation almost like you're sinking into footsteps because you have so much time on your feet. You're not having a foot strike hit the ground and then get back up in the air again. And what that does, if I keep having you run long and slow, you feel heavy like you're running in sand or mud. So that would be terrible if you had that sensation on race day, that heaviness. And that's a common mistake that a lot of people do is that they panic by backing off on some of their volume, replacing it with intensity because they're like, oh my God, I haven't done enough volume. And then they go out and they ruin everything by doing an hour long zone two. It's too late for that adaptation to take place inside of two weeks. So whatever you've got two weeks out, that's what you've got. So what we do is we look at the final two weeks. And that's the only thing that I would look at within High Rocks is the two weeks leading up. And how do you feel as you are gradually removing volume, replacing it with intensity? And re while replacing that intensity, you're getting more rest if you're doing interval style workout. How are you feeling? And what if you tell me two weeks out, it's like, Jesus, I got jump, man. I am springy. It's like, I'm bouncy. I've got hop. I've just, that's way too soon. So what I would do is modulate that by giving you something longer and slower. As you progress closer and closer to race day, we're evaluating how you feel. And this is where elite athletes are better than recreational because they know what I'm talking about. They know because they've experienced it. And what we're looking for is to feel this, this pop. Now, what if you feel three days out and you feel heavy and sluggish? What do you do? Well, what I do is I make you run the opposite of long and slow. I make you run short and extremely fast, like three 60-meter sprints with full recovery in, bet in between. And what that will do is tighten up your posterior chain, and it will bring that jump back into your step. Now, a lot of athletes, what they do is, is when they're recreational and they don't have a lot of experience leading up to a big event, they're, they're going to say, naturally, I feel heavy and sluggish. Well, do you feel heavy and sluggish because your body's about to go into war and it's actually trying to prepare by resting and making you want to rest Right. And that's a different feeling than when you go out for a jog and feeling heavy. So what I'm talking about is actually during movement, not while you're just hanging out. If you feel sluggish and heavy, like you want to lay down while doing nothing, that's a good thing because your body's prepping for battle. But don't confuse the two sluggish and heavy while moving is what we're talking about. So what you do is you optimize, you dial in based upon long and slow, right? 
or shorten extremely fast. And that's what you're actually doing for these events. You're backing off slightly, but I wouldn't consider it a full-blown taper where we're knocking 40% of your volume out. Okay. Okay. And d d just following on from that, uh, the, uh, when, when we met in Chicago, you, you mentioned that you felt some people warm up for an event too late, too close to their start time. Yeah. Uh, which I found quite interesting, actually. I, I never thought of that before. So can, can you talk about that a, li a little bit? Sure. So what, what we must realize is a warm up is, is it needs to consist of three things. Um, what we're doing, the first of all, is you're, you're warming up your cardiorespiratory system. Essentially, you're elevating your heart rate. What people must realize is that it takes your aerobic system and your aerobic system is what activates your slow twitch fibers. And it's what uses this oxygen as a source of fuel. And that, that aerobic system is essential for a high rocks event, right? Your, your aerobic system becomes your dominant source of, of energy to fuel your muscles within after, for sure after two minutes. And some would argue after a minute, your aerobic system becomes the most dominant source of, of, of energy. Well, when you start a, a, an event, let's just say you at three, two, one, go, the, the gun goes off at high rocks. All three of your energy systems fire. You have a very short-term energy system that's very powerful. It delivers more energy than any other system. It's called your phosphagen system, and it only lasts for about 10 seconds fully turned on. That energy system burns clean. Yeah, it does only last for 10 seconds, but it's the first energy system that allows you to move. After 10 seconds, that system is gone. What do you have left? You've got your anaerobic system and your aerobic system. Now, here's the problem. Those are both turning on, but it's your aerobic system that turns on last. It takes your aerobic system upwards of 90 seconds to fully turn on. Think about like if you are sitting down and, and what is your resting heart rate? And then think about after your thousand meters in high rocks, what is your heart rate? Well, it takes time for your heart rate to get from resting when you're standing on the starting line up to its operating, let's call temperature. So in my case, it would be a heart rate of 162. So I go from a heart rate of 42 to 162. That takes time, 90 seconds. Well, where are you getting your energy from in that 90 seconds? While well, it's warming up, you get it anaerobically. Now that's unfortunate because the anaerobic system, it doesn't burn clean. As a byproduct of using this anaerobic energy, we produce what we know as lactic acid. Now, lactic acid is two things. It's the lactate and the acidity. The acidity is what we're most concerned about. If we don't eliminate this acidity, meaning if it builds up, it eventually gets to a level where it interferes with our muscle's ability to function. Well, there's two ways to get rid of this acidity. One is, you slow down. You slow down so it doesn't accumulate. You stay below what we call your lactate threshold, your maximum sustainable pace. The other way is your slow twitch fibers. Your slow twitch fibers, what they do is they need energy to help them move. Mostly they use oxygen, right? That oxygen will convert a carbohydrate or fat into fuel. Well, it also loves lactate and it will consume that lactate as a fuel when it's present. So when you're using this anaerobic energy and you produce this lactic acid, the slow twitch fibers see that lactate as a fuel source. And when it consumes that lactate as a fuel source to help those slow twitch fibers move, it takes the acidity and it removes it from the body. So that's why when we talk about aerobic training, and developing our slow twitch fibers, one of the major measures of how aerobically fit you are is how fast can you recover? How fast can you clear fatigue causing metabolites? How fast can you lower your heart rate? So when you start in high rocks and you've gone that past that 10 seconds and you only have this anaerobic energy, you're producing fatigue. And that fatigue, if, if, if you're not careful, will completely ruin your performance. 
So this is the most important part about a high rocks event is you must be patient from that 10 seconds until your aerobic system kicks in, which if you don't get a warm up, call it 90 seconds. So that 80 second period of time is where you can ruin your event by going too fast. I'm telling you, every single person that does a high rocks feels good for two minutes. The question is, is how do you feel after two minutes? If you went too fast after two minutes, you're gonna know it because you weren't patient enough. Now here's where the warm up piece comes in. When we're talking about properly warming up your cardiorespiratory system, what we're talking about is doing something hard enough, difficult enough, long enough that it elevates your heart rate. Just as if we did a bunch of hamstring stretches right now, and we actually, we do a bunch of those static stretches, we lengthen those hamstrings, and let's, let's say that we get up and we walk around for five minutes, and then we go back to testing how well our hamstrings have actually, are, 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 have benefited from that stretch. Well, our insides encounter resistance. So what we want to do is we want to minimize the resistance when the gun goes off to help our aerobic system turn on faster. So by elevating your cardiorespiratory system, your heart rate during your warm up, you take less time to actually get to your operating temperature. So meaning instead of 90 seconds, it could take less than 60 seconds, which is amazing because now you don't have to use so much anaerobic energy, which is the most dangerous source of energy system of them all. So that's why you must warm up. Now, a lot of people, what they must realize is, is that that warm up is going to be fatiguing. It's not easy because you're trying to get your heart rate up to lactate threshold. So what happens, unfortunately, is that you end up burning that phosphagen system. You also have produced some lactic acid and you've also done some carb depletion. You must allow your body sufficient time to get back to homeostasis, to get back to resting. And so a lot of athletes think, man, I got to stay warm. I got to be like a fighter going into the ring. You got to have some sweat going. No, 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 no. Take it. If you're sitting in a holding cell and it's 30 minutes out, you're okay. Now, the other piece that I want to talk about is the other two. When we talk about a warm up, yeah, cardiorespiratory system, getting your lungs, your heart, your breathing, your temperature elevated. <clears throat> That's why it's called a warm up. But the other piece is your neurological system, your brain. Remember, your brain is responsible for the recruitment of your muscle fibers, it's re responsible for the sequencing of those muscle fibers. So, Think about your brain must send a signal when you're running from its your brain down to the feet to make the, the legs move when you run. So how do you prepare the brain for the movement of running? Well, what you must do is challenge the brain to send the signal, not the long way zigzagging all the way down to the feet. You want it streamlined the fastest way. So what do you do? You run short, and this is where stride outs become important. 40 meter, 60 meter sprints to force the brain to recruit fibers quickly and efficiently. So that's why you would do three 40 meter, maybe even three 60 meter strides with full recovery in between to challenge your neurological system to get the brain warmed up, right? That's the purpose. The other piece is to tighten the posterior chain so you get that jump, that hop back. And then the last piece is you got to prepare for the movement. So if you're preparing for running, don't hop on the rower. You got to run. Prepare the muscles so they're not surprised. Okay. If I was recommending a warm-up protocol, what I would do is I would start out with easy running and I would allow the body, the muscles, adequate time to warm up. Okay. I would maybe do uh, start out by doing a 200-meter walk, a 200-meter jog, I would then maybe do a little bit of, of uh, dynamic drills, range of motion, leg swings, things as such as that, working up my range of motion. 
Then I would do a decent zone two, maybe even 10 minutes. After my zone two, what I would do is I would do some stride outs. I'd see how I feel in that stride out, maybe 40 meters, 60 meters. My posterior chain is not tight. I feel sluggish. I feel heavy. I may do a couple more, as many as five. And then what I would do is I would back off by doing a little bit more zone two, and I would probably call it I'm good. So the total volume of that warm-up may be 30 minutes. That's going to take me at least 30 minutes to recover, not 15. So take it easy after that. If you got 45 minutes of time, it's not the end of the world. I'd be completely fine with that. When I did my Ironman warm-up, you know what happened? I warm up an hour before because that's all you have the opportunity to do. And you know what? It all worked out fine. The key is, is you got to make sure beforehand that you've hit the three variables, cardiorespiratory warm-up, get your heart rate elevated, prepare the muscles for the movement and the intensity. And then the third is get that brain warmed up, do something hard, quick, challenge that brain to move, and recruit, sequence those fibers. And that's what I would do. Okay. Well, wow, Brilliant. All right, love yeah. it. Uh, um, this is this has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. I could probably I, talk talk to you all day. I can't believe this happened because of a conversation on a field. <laughs> it's so wonderful. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, do, do you want to tell us about like the, the work that you do and the the work that you're going to do? Uh, you know, related to high rocks and so on. Sure. So I, I like I said at the beginning, I'm a a specialist in 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 endurance and and building of, of aerobic capacity and um i'm also a specialist in the assessments of the type of athlete that does high rocks and what i mean by that is we have we have two categories of athletes in the world today we have strength-based athletes and then we have endurance-based athletes what's beautiful about high rocks is the run represents 50 percent on average the total amount of time so it gives strength-based athletes a tremendous opportunity to perform and to perform extremely well. So what I do is, is, is I understand how both sides, both athletes need to be assessed so that they know what category they fit in, but also what type of training that they need to be doing. So the, the High Rocks Aerobic Capacity course, the intent really is, is to give coaches and athletes a better understanding of the event itself in terms of performance um, when they actually hit the floor. And the reason why it's called the aerobic capacity course is because it's a long time domain. This is not a sprint. What we're talking about here is, is, is improving your overall capacity. Now, aerobic capacity, I know that it means your VO2 max. Yes, that's a part of this course. But also, we dive deep into zone two training. For example, zone two. How do you actually know where your zone two is? Yeah, you could follow Maffetones, 180 minus your age. Some people do different, where they have min-max numbers. Or you could get a VO2 test. But we must recognize that when we race, we are not racing based upon heart rate. We're base, racing based upon speeds. And that's how we train. So when you do zone two, are you even aware of your speed as you're doing it? Well, we do a deep dive in that. And then what makes up the combination between VO2 max high intensity training and zone two easy training? Well, what sits in the middle is what we call lactate threshold. And we do deep dives into that maximum sustainable pace. You know, earlier when we talked about where's that sticking point in a 400 meter around the track, you know, like where was your 400? Like if I asked you, where do you have that sensation on your lap around the track where you feel that urge to slow down where the brain says, if you don't slow, we're not going to finish. You know, I said mine was 240 to 250. Where's yours? I think it would be around the same. I think you start hurting around 200 and then, you know, you get yeah. to 250 and you start to start to worry. So for in the course, one of the things that I do point out is that, you know, there are tools that we have that give us feedback on how we're feeling. So this isn't an anomaly, what you and I feel. Everyone in the audience feels what we just said where the brain says, if you don't slow down, you're not gonna finish. 
The reason why I feel it at 240 and you feel it in the, around the same area where the brain says, if you don't slow down, we're not going to finish is because you've now gone into a non-sustainable pace. And the brain's telling you when, in fact, now you are dying. If you don't slow down and get below your lactate threshold, I'm going to shut you down because of that accumulation of acidity that we talked about. So that's an example of, of some of the content that we dive into. This is a high rocks course. We dive into first time athletes and how can you have a good performance? Remember, athletes only remember what they did last. It's called the theory of recency, meaning you could have an amazing workout and you bomb your last interval and you know how your workout went? You bombed it. If you have a bad high rocks event, you know what you're going to think of high rocks? It's going to be a bummer. So what we want to do is anybody that has the courage to sign up for the first time, let's make it a good event. And that's what a portion of the programming piece comes in, how to make it a good event. The other is though, retention. If you've done it before, how do you get an athlete to want to go back? By giving them tools to show them where the opportunity for performance improvement sits, whether it's in a segment of their actual result that they backed off too much, they paced it too much, they didn't attack with enough integrity, enough courage, those pieces, or Maybe what they did is they went out a little bit hot and they should have paced it a little bit differently for performance. And so we dive into ways to get an athlete who did it once to come back and do it again to set a dramatic personal best. And that's what the essence of this course is. I love the course. I'm, I, I love the audience that we had the first time. Um, we had, you know, 30 people there. and. Um, yeah, that was a fun day. Okay. All right. So, so that's a course. Is that online or as something that you're doing in person? It's right now live. Um, th th we're, we're right now we're, we're building out the, the level one and I'm helping with their physiology side. Um, and then that's going to be dovetailing into the specialty courses themselves. The plan is to do the live version on Sundays. Okay. At yeah. every event. Okay. And it, it, what's, what's the website there? So the website that they'll be posted, they'll be posted on high rocks. Okay. Um, and then aerobiccapacity.com, all one word is my site. Um, the plan is, is to, to formalize all of the content and launch uh, first part of April. Okay. All right. also so the one we did in Chicago was a trial. Um you know, to build out content and then to use that as promo pieces coming up. But yeah, the plan is uh, starting in April to be at every one uh, from there on out. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's awesome. Brilliant. All right. Well, th thank you for this. Just one more question that, that came in. Yep. Who um, who from the world of, of CrossFit or, or wherever else would you like to see a high, at High Rocks and you think would give it a good crack? Wow, you're so good. <laughs> Did you? someone just text you that? Uh, yeah one of, one of the followers yeah yeah so that's really good that's a man so so i coached jeff adler who's the crossfit games champion and we were just in europe uh we we were in the uk and then we went over to, to paris up to belgium and then down to milan and uh we spent some time talking about high rocks and and just the layout and the events and uh, we were talking about um, Hunter and and doing a head to head, and Jeff Adler is. What's interesting is that this is Hunter Sandbox. It's not Jeff Adler Sandbox. Hunter is 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 trains for this. He does this. Like we saw how Hunter did when he crossed over and tried to go in CrossFit. It it, it didn't work so well. So. He's a specialist in this space. And, and I know Hunter very well. He's he came out and stayed with you know me for a week. And I know him very well. And he's a great guy. I, I, I would, in talking with Jeff, I'm like, what do you think? And Jeff said, if he had a shot at winning, he'd race him. He'd race him just to know. And what Jeff is good at is the obstacles, obviously. He's extremely good. 
Now, I said earlier that Jeff is a good runner, but he's nowhere near in Hunter's league. I mean, Hunter is a phenomenal runner for his size. It's it's remarkable. But I I would I would love, I would love, I would pay to see the two of them go head to head when there is time for Jeff to put in some more running volume. Jeff does not train. Jeff runs two times a week. And you know, he could run sub five, but he's not in, in Hunter's league. And Hunter would pick up too much time. Uh, and Jeff wouldn't make up for it. But if Jeff ran four days a week, maybe off season, I think that would be a race for the ages. And that's what I'd love to see. I would love to see the best in functional fitness that is great at running go after, and not necessarily just Hunter, but maybe after you know five people, mm -hmm. a small space. And I think that would be that would be awesome. And I and I think it would be good for both sides, you know, an awareness piece for CrossFit athletes, uh, as well as as within the high rock space, because high rocks is let's face it, it's a hybrid event, um, like triathlons are, but it's not what CrossFit is. CrossFit's at the extreme, um, and so it it but but it would showcase that someone who specializes in the strength-based obstacle elements, the non-running side, that this sport, you can still dominate and do well. Let's yeah. hope we see would it you, one day. You like that? You like yeah. that idea? Yeah, I'd love it. I'd love, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. It'd be brilliant. It'd be awesome. Yeah, I don't know if you, you remember, but back in the day, Sergio Garcia, or no, Phil Mickelson and, and Tiger Woods had a face-off, and it was, you know, just the two of them. And it was, it was like, I'll never forget it. This, this, the two icons in there, you know, just going head to head. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 what I love the most is that Hunter is a competitor. <clears throat> and so is Jeff. They're 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 not intimidated, they're courageous. They know how to win. And that to me would be a battle. And imagine you pick three different like lottery winners that are elite that can jump into a field and, and to mix it up with them it could be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I anyway, that's my dream. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> not, that I thought, not, not that I've thought about it. <laughs> Um, all right, brilliant. Thanks for this so much. Hopefully, maybe we can you, get man. you on again sometime because uh, I appreciate could, you, man. Talk Thank you. Hey, yeah. Right. great, yeah, great seeing you. And, and and thanks for all the nice words and 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 you know hanging out when we did in Chicago. I I, I value that a lot. Yeah, me too. All right, brilliant. Thank you. All right, take thanks, care, man. everyone. All right. All right. Yep, take care. Bye.